My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. <clears throat> Jesus, therefore, six days before the Pasch, came to Bethany, where Lazarus had been dead, whom Jesus raised to life. And they made him a supper there, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those that were at table with him. Initially, our Lord had gone up to Jerusalem <clears throat> for the feast, but when he goes there, he senses the atmosphere of betrayal, of oppression, of bitterness, of hatred, of opposition. And so he withdraws to Bethany. This is just six days before the Paschal Feast. And so we have this great contrast. The lack of hospitality in, Be in Jerusalem, that atmosphere of betrayal, of mistrust, of hatred, and the profound hospitality that he receives in Bethlehem, in Bethany, fruit of authentic love. And they made him a supper there. Mary and Martha and Lazarus extend the hospitality of their domestic church to Jesus. And he savors this. It's the last great piece of hospitality and holiness that he's going to enjoy on this earth. And then Mary does a very special thing. She's going to win the Oscar for this. She takes a pound of, pound of ointment of right spikenard of great price and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Mary does say something of profound affection in total contrast to what our Lord is going to experience in the coming week. She takes this pound of ointment of great price it's as though she goes to her local ATM and withdraws everything she has there <clears throat> and spends it all on a bottle of perfume. She really treats the body of Christ very well. St. Rosemaria liked to say that in all our altars, in all our sacristies, in all our tabernacles, we have to try and make those places Bethany with the cleanliness with the affection, with the care. And so if you have a chance in your local parish or up country in your outstation, see what you can do to try and make those standards of care of our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, the standards of Bethany, so that we really treat him well. So the little children who come into the church can see that we give the best to God and that, that becomes a custom in your family. And also the little children, with any money they may get as part of their allowance or presents on their birthday or Christmas or whenever, they get into the habit from a young age of giving something back to God, of contributing out of what they have to the maintenance, maintenance of the church. So that in some way they also recognize that God has given great things to me and so I need to give great things back to God. And she anointed the feet of Jesus. Whenever we see feet being mentioned in the gospel, something very important is taking place. There's this great gesture of affection. And not only that, but she wipes his feet with her hair we don't often see in Hollywood movies the actress wiping the feet of the actor with her hair. 
It's an even more profound gesture of affection. And the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. You get the impression that it wasn't just filled with the odour of the ointment, but it was filled with the fragrance of authentic love and affection. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, he that was about to betray him, as often happens in the words of the gospel, we find this great contrast. On the one hand, there's this Mary of Bethany, who knew how to love and knew how to express that love, to show it in concrete deeds. And now we have her contrasted with Judas, who was the apostle who did not know how to love. He never learned how to love. All the formation that he received, all the beautiful words and gestures that he heard from the lips of Jesus and the actions and the miracles that our Lord had performed, nothing penetrates. It's like water off a duck's back. The only thing he's thinking about is money. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Experts say that 300 pence in those days was equivalent to a year's wages. That sheds light on how much money Mary of Bethany had spent on this ointment. She got the best she could find, the genuine article. It was no cheap imitation. There's real quality in what she gives to God. And Judas, who has a mercenary mind, misses completely the richness of the gesture and all he focuses on is money. There was a priest in the Philippines once who was collecting in his parish for the roof of the church because they needed some repairs for the roof of the church and he had a collection for this and a few weeks later, in his homily, he said, you know, we got various reactions from various parishioners. Some people complained that we were fixing the roof of the church. They didn't want to give because they said, why is this money not given to the poor? And he said, as parish priest, my experience is that when we're collecting for the roof of the church, the people who give to fix the roof of the church are the people who also give when it's time to have a collection for the poor. But our experience is also that those who do not want to give when we're collecting for the roof of the church, when it comes to collecting for the poor, they also don't give either. It was a rather slap in the face to many of his parishioners, but he was saying some home truths and bringing it home to them. These were the words of Judas. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence? And so we find that Judas knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. The important significance of the gesture of Mary that's going to last for the whole of eternity, expressed to a large extent in the altars of repose all over the world, where the church and parishioners, with their flowers, with their attention, with their candles, with their presence, try to take care of the body of Jesus, learning from the gesture of Mary of Bethany. But all of this passes Judas by. And then we're told in the next sentence that he said this, not because he cared for the poor. It's interesting how St. John is so clear in his condemnation of Judas. He doesn't mince his words. He doesn't care for the poor. If there's one basic message that Christ came to teach all his followers, it's to care for the poor, <coughs> to be concerned about the less privileged. Whenever you did it to one of these least of my brethren, you did it to me. But even that basic message is this, is a message that this 
member of the apostles has not managed to grasp. And then St. John says, he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. So this fellow apostle singles out Judas for this particular label. And he knows what he's talking about. John calls a spade a spade. And of all the apostles, of all the evangelists, John is the one that speaks most about charity. But when he comes to Judas, he has to speak the truth. Sometimes the greatest charity is to confront people with the truth. And often that truth is uncomfortable. But people need to hear that truth and we need to hear that truth. The truth about ourselves, the truth about others, the truth about society. Society has to function on truth. He was a thief and having the purse carried the things that were put therein. He used to steal from the communal purse. This is like a, a salvo being fired over the bows of every human person for all eternity that is in charge of money. St. John is saying to us, be super careful about your own money and be 1,000 times more careful about other people's money because money can become very sticky. The one thing John seems to say to us that brought Judas down was money. And so everybody always in all circumstances, no matter who they are, has to have a healthy mistrust of themselves when it comes to money. And that should lead us to have an enormous transparency in relation to accountancy or writing down the things we spend or giving an account to anybody who entrusts money to us, even if they don't ask us for it. And if they say it's not necessary, well, then all the more necessary that we would be meticulous, go out of our way to account for every last shilling passing through our hands. Because of the great message of Judas in Holy Week. Jesus therefore said, therefore said, let her alone that she may keep it against the day of my burial. Our Lord is very clear. She's done a beautiful thing. She's spent an awful lot of money on me. In some ways, she's made up for all the bitterness and the hatred and the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, all the suffering that I'm going to endure in this coming week. It's like a message to us and to everybody of all time that we can make up to our Lord, atone to him for the sins, for the ungratitude, for the negligence, for the meanness and stinginess of humankind all over the world that have not known how to be generous with their God. Sometimes we look at wonderful buildings, cathedrals that have been built by people of previous centuries. And we see the enormous efforts they made with such little means to do something great for God, to leave a great testimony of their faith. It's one of the things we have to try and infect people with, that thinking, to be generous to God, to give back to God. What shall I give back to God for all that he has given to me, says the Psalms. Now on this earth, with the things that God has given to me, and also in my will when I die, what will I be remembered for? Those things that are there in my possession when I die, in many ways, they don't belong to me anymore. As all these things belong to God. And so Judas can lead us to a new generosity, a new detachment, a new care with the material things of the world. Because it's oh so possible to get totally caught up in those things focused on the things of this world and forget completely about the eternal wedding feast to which we are called. And so Mary gives us this great example. 
of detachment, of generosity, of poverty of spirit, of knowing the things that are really of worth and of value. She treats her God well. And that's why Mary wins the Oscar. And that's why with young people from an early age, teach young children how to give back to God and the presents that they receive, that they give them to other children that don't have, or that they give donations to the church from the monetary presents they may get, that they grow up through life learning how to give, how to give back and seeing and thinking, how can I give more? It's a great pathway to holiness, to joyfulness and happiness in this world. There's a phrase that says that wisdom sometimes comes with age and sometimes age comes alone. We can say that about all of the virtues. Sometimes generosity comes with age and sometimes age comes alone. A young person who doesn't know how to be generous, who is selfish, mean, stingy. Well, it's a pity. They have not learned in the, their life how to be generous. But an older person, maybe in the latter years of their life, who hasn't learned how to be generous and to give, it's really the pits. It's a very sad situation. Judas is a bit like the patron saint of all of those people who have not learned to be generous with their life, with the passage of time, with all the good things God has given to them. Hasn't learned, haven't learned how to see these things as gifts. And notice how this great gesture of Mary takes place in the domestic church. Each of us are entrusted with the domestic church to form future saints. And that means forming them in virtue, teaching them what justice is, what charity is. To give away things we don't need, that's not charity, that's justice. Mother Teresa says, give until it hurts. When we're told that Judas put a price on this spike and nard ointment, 300 pence, a year's wages. Well, we can definitely say that that must have hurt Mary. Maybe it hurt her a lot. Mother Teresa invites us to give until it hurts. Invite children to give until it hurts. To give what they don't have to give. To give the shirt off their back. It's a great way to live. It leads us to forget all about ourselves, our own wants. You see, the devil is all the time helping us to focus on ourselves, to think about my wants. I want this, I want that. Christ invites us to think about the needs of others. And we know that Martha and Mary and Lazarus were, were not millionaires. They were just simple people in a small village. But they had great values. They loved Jesus Christ. And they wanted to show it with deeds. It's easy to say to Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. Maybe Judas even said those words. But Mary showed it with her deeds. And so this Holy Week and this Lent, well, we have to try and see how we can go out of our way to show our Lord with our deeds and make resolutions for the whole of our life to show our generosity with our deeds. There was a priest in Manila once, Don Bosco priest, who told a story of how there was a a kid at a nearby street corner who used to sell cigarettes to the cars that stopped at the lights. And this kid didn't know how to manage his money. He was about eight years of age and he used to give his money to the priest to look after for him. And every day he would bring maybe 20 shillings or so, 25 shillings from the cigarettes he had sold. And then he would come and ask for five or 10 shillings to buy some rice. And he saved up a little bit of money, a little bit extra. And one day, the kid came and he asked the priest for 60 shillings. And that was about everything he had saved up. And the priest was a bit curious and asked him, well, why do you want 60 shillings? Normally he asked for much less for his rice. He said, well, there's a woman who's given birth to a baby under the bridge 
and she's no milk for the baby and milk costs 60 shillings a can. So I thought I would buy some milk for the baby. The priest was very moved. He was this young kid who had nothing in this world. A pair of slippers, a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Manages to save up what for him is a small fortune. This orphan kid with nothing. But at the first sight of someone in need, was willing to go and spend all that money to help the need of that other person. How happy God must be, he said, when he looks down on this earth and sees a soul like that shining up at him. A soul that has known how to put the needs of others before his own. What a refined soul, unless you become like little children you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Lord, help us to be like that little kid. Teach our children to be like that little kid. We all have something to give. Maybe at our time occasionally, maybe our energy, it might be material things. It might be thinking out of the box. It might be a visit to an elderly person or to a family that needs something or to a handicapped kid, giving them a few Moments or hours of joy and learning that these are the greatest happinesses on the planet so that we don't become like Judas. It's interesting how Holy Week presents these two models for us as though presenting a choice before us. Learn to lead a simple and sober life, to be happy in your domestic church, having authentic values there, or learn to be like Judas, who missed all the great lessons, in spite of all of his Christian formation. And think about all the formation that Judas received. And you could say, with that English expression, straight from the horse's mouth. He couldn't have got more authentic formation. But it was all like water off a duck's back. And so all the formation to which we have been exposed, perhaps in a Christian Catholic family, or in a Catholic school, or in our local parish that our parents have brought us to ever since we were knee-high to a grasshopper, or to all the supernatural families of the church to which we've been exposed, people who've spent their life educating other people's children, our religious communities that have spent their life taking care of other people's sick children, handicapped, mentally, physically, or taking care of hospitals, or hospitals for the poor who can't afford the most basic medical care, the forgotten people of the world. We can be so proud of our church because our church has given us this wonderful example of care, of generosity, given an example to the world of authentic charity taking care of the other Christs that God has placed around us. And Mary of Bethany has shown us how Christ wants us to treat each soul, each body. Whenever you did this to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And that's how the church has always tried to care for every soul that has come in contact with it. For its bodily welfare, for its spiritual welfare. For its eternal destiny, for its calling to the eternal wedding feast, so that every mind and heart might be formed, be able to communicate the fragrance of Christ, to put on that fragrance through the sacrament of confession, to confess our sins for the times we haven't been generous or haven't cared about others or haven't absorbed the formation to which we've been exposed. Fulton Sheen says that when a water from a tap is dripping onto cement, drip, 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 well, over time, that drop of water can burrow a hole in the cement. And he said, sometimes the grace of God dripping onto our skull, over time, burrows a hole through that hard skull into our heart and into our soul. So that grace brings about change, conversion. In spite of our miseries, our past sins, 
for the times when we have been made have been a bit more like Judas than like Mary. Well, this week is a time to make a decision to change. Change our heart. Lord, take out this heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Judas had a heart of stone. All the great values passed him by, totally insensitive to divine love incarnate with whom he was in contact in so many intimate ways. And he was the trusted apostle. He had the care of the purse. He had authority, he had prestige. <clears throat> All the other apostles trusted him, but he betrayed their trust. Judas is like a lesson to us, no matter how much trust is placed in us, in the organization, no matter how much prestige we may enjoy, no matter how many good things we might have done in the past, we all have the potential to be a thief. We all have the potential to be leading a double life. Great on the outside, respected like Judas was, with prestige, but yet betraying that trust on the inside, lack of unity of life. The Second Vatican Council talks a lot about unity of life. The Pharisees lacked unity of life. There were one thing on the outside and there were something else on the inside. We all have that capacity to have a profound lack of unity of life. That's why we have to take care of our formation, take care of our spiritual life, take care of our sacraments, get to confession frequently, admit our miseries, realize our faults and our sins, our wretchedness, so that we follow the true model who is Mary of Bethany. And we build up the domestic church along those lines so that the souls that God has placed around us may see authentic virtue, authentic value in us, just like we see with Mary of Bethany. And so this anointing of the feet of Jesus gets transmitted down through the centuries because this is the gesture of great affection for the body of Christ. that each one of us are called to display, not just on Holy Thursday, but in our churches, in our outstations, in our tabernacles, and most of all in our own souls when we go to receive the body of Christ, so that we have that great refinement with our Lord, and that we make up to him for all the sacrilegious, sacrilegious communions and all the other sacrileges that may be committed against his body in this world, that we atone to him like Mary of Bethany did. To a large extent, this is one of the messages of Holy Week and of Holy Thursday in particular, and of this event that takes place six days before the Pasch. And so Mary, may you help us to make very good use of these days and hours ahead, to savour the richness of this time, to pay very attention to each step of the liturgy and the story of Holy Week that is so rich, so rich for our souls, for those of our children, and for the whole of our domestic church. Mary, may you take us by the hand and lead us through these great hours so that we can truly learn all the great messages and lessons that Mary of Bethany has to teach us. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me during this meditation. I ask your help to put them into practice. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me.